Welcome everybody to today's podcast episode. Um, I'm really excited by probably one of my youngest ever guests. I think the youngest ever guest I've had on the podcast. And um, rather than me introduce her to you all, I'm going to ask her to do it for herself. So over to you, Rio. Thank you so much um, for having me. And I, I'm, I think I am the youngest guest. So um, <laughs> my name is uh, Rio. I'm 18 years old. I'm currently the club captain for Crystal Palace under 23s um, and also a part of a, a college football programme called Level 7 Academy. Um, and that's a that's a short intro um, about <laughs> myself. No, that's a good that's a good little intro thank you it's nice for to jump straight in so I had the privilege of obviously getting to know you Rio for from Clubhouse this amazing new app that everybody is on and just hearing you speak in some of the Clubhouse rooms has been just inspiring the, the way you speak and you're so eloquent and wise for one so young um, and I, I think that's what's drawn me and a lot of people to you um, and that kind of drew me to wanting to have you on this podcast really and talk about you know your sporting life as it were and, and what it what goes on behind the scenes because that's what this podcast is about it's it's not about all the glory it's about what it takes to be uh, a top level athlete so you, you are Crystal Palace Football Club's under 23 captain um, and you obviously are part of the college level seven academy but before we touch on those I'd like I always like to ask about the early years now you're only 18 they're all early years yeah. <laughs> but sort of growing up were you always into sports how was it for you oh yeah I was one of those that probably had every single piece of sporting equipment that you could think of where it be American football a golf club uh tennis like I was just into everything but the one that really drew me into the love of the game was the football um mm -hmm. And it all really started when I was about five years old in the park with my mum. She uh, gave me the, this little Man United football. And I think that's that's where it all began. And I, I really like to reflect on that because I was just such a sporty kid. Um, I remember sports day um, was my favourite day. <laughs> I, I always looked forward to it and I got so competitive and everyone knew how competitive I was. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I'm just such, I'm I just love sport in general, men's, women's. Um, I just love it. Um, but football was the one that just kind of drew me to it, and I, I didn't I didn't I haven't stopped. Um, and I'm, I'm continuing to play now, so it's all it's really great to see the journey that I've been on so far. How old were you when you first started playing football? Then, uh, probably properly like maybe six, so really young. Yeah. Um. And that's when I kind of got introduced to kind of my first um, team in a way. And um, that was called Camden, um, just my local club. And I was really lucky and fortunate to have an all girls team because I was really rare. Yeah. Um, so I was just grateful that I got put in that environment from such a young age. And I remember the kit being 10 times big for me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that's, that's where it all began, really. Yeah, grassroots football at its best. And so what, what happened then, obviously, when did, you know, when did you kind of like realise that actually you're quite good at it and you'd like to make something of, of you know, your ability? Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's funny to look back on because I, I don't think I had that kind of moment. Mm -hmm. um, I think I relied more on people telling me that you've got something special okay. um, and start to, to trial out for these bigger, bigger clubs. And... Mm -hmm. If I look at my journey, I was in the I was at Camden for ten years at that grassroots club. I just loved it. I loved the environment, and I think when you're that young girl, I think the environment's so important. Um, if you just look at sport in general, and I'm, it really all started to change for me when I was maybe fifteen, sixteen, and I actually got selected to go um, to America on an international tournament. Um, and I remember kind of how I played and I think I was the youngest in the squad I think I was literally a baby I looked at the pictures I was like oh my god I'm so small compared to everyone else <laughs> but um, I it was in um, New York and I just loved that experience and I think when I came we had a match against Miami and I think I came off the bench because I was one of the youngest ones and I scored about four goals 
mm. in that game. And I think when I came off the pitch, I was like, I've got something special. So when I got back to the UK, that's when I really started to push and got a lot more confidence and started to go on trials. Mm. That's amazing. I, yeah, I can imagine, you know, going abroad and doing a sport that you love, that that would be, you know, amazing and definitely spark a fire in you. What um, Have you done many sort of tournaments like that since? Was that, was that a one-off or what's happened since then? Yeah, so um, those tournaments, so I did one when I was 14, 15 and 16. Mm. So um, it's for people, I think the max age was 16. Um, so you have kind of three years. Um, and I got selected every time and I on my uh, set two on two occasions I was captain and on the final one I got a bronze medal um, and I was just so ecstatic because the competition obviously in the States is really competitive yeah and um, we beat um, a Philadelphia team who actually beat us in the group stage about five nil and we we beat them in the semi Wow. Um, and I was just really, I was <laughs> over the moon. I actually had a concussion, so I don't really remember wow. much of that game. <laughs> so that, um, what during the game you got? Did you get get a head knock? No. So it was it was before I didn't get to play in the bronze medal game, and mm -hmm. because I got a concussion, they ruled me out. And I just remember myself. I had the sunglasses on because obviously the light. Yeah. And I was literally just chit. I was literally like another coach on the sideline, just <laughs> every single tackle. I was making sure that we won that game. Yeah. Um, and I think that just shows how I am. If I can't play, I'll be the coach on the <laughs> sideline. I was going to say, you know where your we know where your career is going already, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Gonna be coaching at some point. That's if you're passionate about it. I I saw a clip the other day. Um, it was Lucy Bronze, and I remember years ago she always said that she never be a coach, didn't want to be a coach. And then there's this clip from when she was with the in England squad, and she was like rallying the troops and and giving them tips and stuff like that. And now she's changed her mind. And uh, you know, I think the love of the game makes you passionate. You just want your teammates to do well, even if you probably can't be on the pitch yourself. Um, I know I'd probably feel like that if it was me. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Tell me about the grassroots then, you know, all those years at Camden, what was that like? Cause you know, I've spoken to um, obviously a lot of male footballers, I've coached some male footballers um, around mindset and life and stuff. And it's, it's very different, the men's game to the women's game. So what was it like grassroots for you growing up and then obviously training and stuff for Camden? How did that, was it just like, oh, we'll just show up at the weekend or did you train in the week and how did that work for you? Yeah, I really miss, I miss the, the grassroots kind of dynamic because <laughs> uh, I laugh at it when I look back at it compared to my, my training schedule now. So yeah. really what it was, um, I think we had maybe one training night or possibly two but that really depended on the weather for example obviously yeah. we majority of the time we were on grass pitches so I remember when I was younger a lot of the league games was probably postponed if it just started to rain just a, a touch and it was very <laughs> frustrating because for me I always got like public transport so I'm halfway there and I get the text in the group chat and I said oh my god because oh, my, my life god. literally surrounded um and all what I do during the week was all towards that game and that was literally at grassroots level mm -hmm. um but I really do miss that I just love the whole atmosphere of the grassroots game um I think it's just more of a sense of community mm -hmm. um and I, I look back at it and all the coaches the, the amount of most of them are volunteers and the amount of hours they put in to just really they understand how important it is to get these young girls playing at that level and try and keep them in the game yeah um so look, some might not go into professional football, but how can they start to keep them active just in general? Because mm -hmm. there's a massive dropout rate when you get to my age, for example, the 16 to 18 age range There's a massive dropout. Like if I look at my grassroots club, um, Alexandra Park, who I went from Camden to Alexandra Park, and that was kind of a big transfer move for me. <laughs> um, but if I look at that squad, I'm the only player who's actually went on to like an academy level and most of them have either gone to uni or dropped out of football um, mm. and it's a shame really but I think there's there's a long way to go but I think that's just down to the funding at the grassroots level um, mm. because I think if we get more clubs more opportunities more tournaments um, the game's only going to get bigger at that grassroots level. Yeah absolutely you know sadly a lot of it does come down to funding and 
you know, I'm a lot older than you, Rio, and I used to play football and, oh God, it was, you know, <laughs> grass, grassroots plus 10. It was, it was hilarious. Uh, you know, to get to matches, we'd all bundle in one car, it'd be about eight of us. And yeah. <laughs> you know, the kit was shocking. Um, and so were the football boots and uh, the pitches. Well, you know, you, you probably know, you know, some of the pitches I'm sure you've played on are, are questionable. And um, yeah, but it was a lot of the thing for me was it, it was the fun. I, I, I'm like you, I, I played a lot of sport when I was a kid and um, I was a county athlete and um, I, I would have played any sport to be honest. I didn't care about the weather. I just wanted to be involved, but it was, it was a community that we had as a group, as a bunch. That was one of the biggest things that kept me going back. And, and I guess the drop off rate, you know, when we get to sort of 14, 15, 16 for young girls is, I mean, there's so many other things you can be involved in, but of course you become much more self-conscious um, as well. And I think, I don't know, I'm not the expert, but I think that is part of it. You know, I have a young niece who's 15, 16, and she feels very self-conscious. And there's a, there's a certain, I think there's a certain stigma that's attached to sort of playing like the still what's classified as a male dominated sports like football and rugby. I don't know. What's your view on that? Yeah, I think it, looking at my kind of secondary school experience and also primary school mm. it was extremely difficult for me um and I think if it wasn't down to my kind of personal traits and characteristics I probably would have dropped out because if I if I looked at my secondary school for example I was the only girl that played football or even enjoyed sport um so it was extremely difficult for me if I look at maybe some of the friends that I had in secondary school I wouldn't necessarily talk about football because no one else enjoyed it and here I was I had all this I was just bursting to tell everyone how I played on the weekend but no one really wanted to hear it because they just don't enjoy football yeah. um and really even when I tried to to talk about it, it was with the boys and they kind of just overlooked it because I'm a female and I remember if um I look at at lunchtime on the Astro all the girls were kind of just chilling eating lunch I wanted to be on the Astro turf playing football with the boys mm -hmm. and I immediately got the respect when I was in year seven because from most of them came from primary school with me they all knew I could play football so I was lucky that I got that respect but unfortunately that's what that's what happens mm -hmm. and it's incredibly difficult and obviously yes football and rugby you mentioned is very male dominated but I think it just takes more representation and more role models so what I did at that school when I got into the sixth form I was only there for a couple of months until I went to a football academy um, I actually coached uh, the girls football team at lunchtime and I remember often I literally got the tiniest section of the AstroTurf and I was literally confronting some of the boys I said look I'm running a session I want at least half the pitch and I got it because they just respected me like that but I it just takes role models and representations and other girls like me to really just be at the forefront and challenge and then you'll start to get um, improvement and it shouldn't be like that but unfortunately that's where we are um, currently. Yes yeah, it's, it's a challenging time although it's much better than you know when I was a kid I, you know things are a lot better but they still have a long way to go which is which is a sad state of affairs and, and getting young girls involved in more sport knowing that it's okay to get hot and bothered and sweaty and physical yeah. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that there's nothing wrong with exercise it, I think there's this period like where young girls feel like 14 15 you're like very self-conscious and then you probably get sort of early 20s mid 20s and then you're like you want to kind of exercise because it becomes about body image mm -hmm. um and, and mm -hmm. not about the enjoyment of it and just that it's great for your mindset if nothing else to move your body um and maybe I'm right or wrong I don't know but that's kind of like a little bit what I think it's about and you're you're absolutely right we need that more role models we need that visibility you know, visibility is something again that I'm really passionate about hence why I want more young girls like you and young women like you on this podcast you know from all different sports really the more women I can get on this podcast the better um, because I think you know we do need to raise the visibility of women in sport to get young girls to see it and to try and find a way that we can get it on the tv more in the media more 
um, that I'm super, super passionate about that because we're so underrepresented in the media. Um, it is really, really shocking. And when we have talent like yourself, you know, luckily you're a very determined young woman, but I think we lose a lot of our potentially good athletes through, you know, lack of sport, lack, uh, support, lack of funding um, and visibility. So you standing up and champion in football is, you know, I want to commend you for that because I know that can't be easy or maybe you do find it easy. I don't know. <laughs> no, it is difficult because obviously I, I have to balance my kind of schedule within college and football, but I also want to take a lot, a lot of time out of my day is to really put key issues in the spotlight and kind of just raise the awareness. And we shouldn't have to do that, but I'm more than happy to kind of take that time out of my schedule to make sure I can inspire the next generation. So for example, I was on a call last night with, um, a group of under 13s and I did a, a Zoom ball mastery for them. And I know how important that is for them to kind of have that 30 minutes of seeing someone that's progressing in their career and kind of giving them that role model. Yeah. Um, and I think before you touch on a really great point in terms of um, the body image and when you're kind of 14, 15, really self-conscious, because I remember if you look at PE lessons, when the teacher said we're gonna uh, like maybe play with the boys I remember all the girls taking way more longer in the changing room to, like, <laughs> to get ready and like for me I was literally like get my football boots on I'm sprinting out I was always the first one collecting all the equipment right yeah. but like they were scared to go into tackles but I, I understood it because I went through that as well but I kind of just loved the sport so I just got stuck in yeah. but there was a change for me when we did maybe like gymnastics I really like went into a shell because I just didn't enjoy that sport mm. and all the other girls started to enjoy that so it, it is a really tough balance and then when you hit maybe my age and you're starting to look at body image and it's to do with the media again I think yeah that's it it's a really good point but I think it is slowly changing. I think people understand how important it is to remain active. Mm. Um, it could literally just be a 30 minute walk. And I think everyone in this lockdown, that 30 <laughs> minute walk in <laughs> lockdown has been the savior. <laughs> yeah, the savior of everything. And I think everyone's actually starting to feel really grateful if they've even got a garden, for example. Yeah, um, yeah it's been yeah. tough. It's been tough. You know, I, I was banging the, the movement drum way before lockdown, but it's been banged a lot harder during it that, you know, and everyone appreciates it now. And you, you can't underestimate the impacts of just exercise, or just, like just a walk, just getting out every day, getting out in nature and moving our bodies. The body was designed to move at the end of the day. And, and I always say, move your body, move your mindset, move your body, move your mood. It, 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 it shifts your mood. It releases those, those good chemicals that make us feel good. Um, and yeah, when, when we are designed to move, so it's getting that message out to the world, but to the younger generation to keep them in, you know, involved in some kind of activity. Um, what, what I want to ask you sort of what, what's it like now then for you uh, in terms of training? And obviously we're in this pandemic at the moment, but somebody might listen to this podcast you know, once we're out of this pandemic, hopefully. But, but what's your, you know, because it, this podcast is a bit about what it takes to excel and obviously you've got you you have a talent there's no question about that a lot of people have talents but they don't tap into them um and talent isn't going to get you where you want to be alone there has to be other elements added to it so what does your sort of day-to-day -day look like and what is it you feel that you need to do in order to excel yeah I, I really like that message as well because I think a lot of people kind of like to put a filter over that aspect and just focus on the su success success and for people that know me, they'll understand the routine that I do every single day. So if I look at, if we're going out of lockdown, what my normal uh, training schedule looks like. So obviously I'm part of a football college academy as well. So on a Monday, it's a two hour training. On a Tuesday, four hours, including two hours at Crystal Palace. Um, Wednesday is my college game day. Thursday's um, two hour for Crystal Palace. Friday's a strength and conditioning. Saturday is my only rest day and then Sunday is my match day for Crystal Palace and a lot of people you see that that training just the training alone is so difficult but also the travel time um, also the recovery um, it just takes up my whole day 
Um, I think you're going to need to run us through that again because I, I <laughs> write that down there and I couldn't keep up. So, okay, run us through that again, your week. Yes, it is. It is hectic. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so the Monday session is a, it's a two hour uh, session with my uh, college academy yeah. um, and it's really intense, um, but a lot of plyometrics and all these other things that are attached with football, just not, not always just a football session, um, maybe fitness for half an hour. Um, and that, and then during the day is my college day and then we have the training off in the afternoon, um, yeah. Tuesday. Um, again, it's a, it's a two hour training at um, level seven, but they understand that on Tuesdays, obviously I've got Crystal Palace straight afterwards. So they understand my training load, which is really beneficial for me. So then I might have a, a lighter session with my academy because I know I, they know that I have to be at the highest level for Crystal Palace training. Mm. Um, but then on the Wednesday, I have a match day. So they're really... I on the Tuesday night I get home about 11 p.m and I have to recover and be ready for the game on the Wednesday um and then Thursday again Crystal Palace training um and that's the, probably the more intense one because obviously we've got the game on the on the Sunday and then yeah. Friday is strength and conditioning um and I'll tell you now that Saturday I sleep <laughs> it's just I am not moving on that Saturday and, and Sunday's a game day again. So it's it's really hectic, but I love it and I've missed it during this lockdown because it, it just keeps me ticking. Um I, I just love to train. Um because again, what you said before, you could have all the talent in the world, but if you don't work hard, mm. you're not gonna get to reach any level really. Yeah. Um talent only takes you so far. For sure, absolutely. Or skill and no will, you know, that would be a very, you know, and there's been some very skillful, uh, talented sports people, right, but they haven't got the will or they don't want to un unpack their gifts, you know, yeah, what's the point of that? You have to be willing to apply yourself and do all the other elements that go with it in order to, to be the best that you can be. Mm. And, and that sounds like a heck of a week. <laughs> how do you, how do all of those bits play intertwine? Because obviously you're part of Crystal Palace, but you're part of the academy and college. You know, how do you see all of those? Are they all necessary in order to, to get to the top level of the game? Because, you know, you could think, well, you're with Crystal Palace. That, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. So how do they all intertwine and connect to each other? Yeah, I'm, I'm really lucky because of um, kind of the communication between Crystal Palace and also my level seven, because some of my coaches are at Crystal Palace first team. So mm -hmm. they understand my training load and we have it on like this whiteboard who's on high load medium load low load so I think just that it's so crucial for me because before when I was in that school environment they didn't understand my football commitment they they were more on the academic side of things and they didn't understand that maybe I couldn't get my homework done because I had training that night um but this is what I'm so grateful for with uh, the academy in Crystal Palace at the moment and it all intertwines really because if you look at it alone, if I was only training two hour, four hours in total for Crystal Palace, you'd need a lot more than that to be prepared, match ready for the Sunday training. And I think a lot of it is, I, I say my team training, but also I'll do individual work. So it could just be strength and conditioning. It could even be yoga, mm. um, small things like that. But that's what it takes if you want to perform day in, day out. Um, and have your muscles being able to move the next day because of muscle soreness. But um, that's when the recovery comes in and that takes up a chunk of my evening. So it just shows you how much commitment um, that's needed uh, to really reach the, the top level. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing and your dedication to doing it. I mean, obviously you've got a passion for it. So, you know, passion drives you on, right? Desire pulls you along. I, I firmly believe that and whatever you're going after in life you have to find your passion and your desires because that will well, that will get you up on the days when you're probably a little bit more sore than normal or you know not feeling it you're human at the end of the day even when you're yeah. passionate about something you have your days when it's just like oh really today but that's where you know you're doing something you love so it will drive you to get up and get out um what's what what's been the toughest challenges you faced um you know over the years with your footballing career or just playing football what's been your toughest challenges 
I think there's been a few, but I think it's more towards maybe when I was at that grassroots level. So um, for me, if I look at my home life, so my mum's disabled and when I was at that younger age, I didn't really understand um, how maybe she couldn't get to matches or she couldn't stand for a long period of time. And it, it never really affected me, but it was always at the back of my mind. Um, and I knew she would have done absolutely anything to get to watch me play, right? And mm. she's always on the phone. I remember if I, if I lose a game, I'm not texting her straight away as I usually would. So she knew I'd be in a mood and she says, right, I've got a, an, a warm bath ready for you and a nice meal when you come back home. But um, I think now it's, I'm really happy because she could watch my games on like a live stream or my highlights. So that for me, her seeing me play is probably my biggest thing because I always want to make her proud. So um, that element of it was really difficult because I would say to her, I scored a 20 yard free kick. It was insane. So I'd have to really describe it in detail. But um, I think that was probably the most challenging. And also when she was going in and out of hospital at the start of 2020, it was a really difficult start to the year. Mm. I think that's when I started to realise also the mental side of the game um, because I really did have a physical and mental burnout. Right. Um, and I, I took a step back and without the support I had around me at the time, God knows where I would have been in that February, maybe March period of 2020, because obviously we were going into that lockdown mm. um, because it was difficult for me because obviously I was coming home um, maybe 1am because I, I kind of got a breakthrough at an under 23 in the championship um, and I was coming in at 1am and I barely got to see my mum. And it was really difficult for me. And I think that was probably the most challenging time for me as a, as a player, but also just me in general as a daughter. It was difficult. Um, but for me, kind of lockdown straight after that was a big blessing for me because I got to spend time with, with my family and really just work to myself mentally as well as physically. And I came out a bit stronger. So I really wouldn't change anything, but I think that was probably the, my, the most difficult, was probably the, the beginning of uh, January. Yeah. And the mental, obviously, you know, I'm super passionate about the mindset and the mental side of, mm -hmm. of life, let alone sport. What, you say you worked on yourself in that period of time. What, what did that look like? What did you do? Yeah, so I was really lucky. I got, um, I had a course with uh, psychology and it focuses on emotional literacy within football. Mm -hmm. um, and we probably had about three sessions, a group sessions uh, with my team. And he, I knew he was offering one-to-one -one support afterwards. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I'm going to reach out to this guy because I really trust him. His name's Kevin George. And mm -hmm. um, he's really helped me a lot. Um, he's, he's told me different techniques. I've been just giving me books to read. I love... See, the only time I read is about maybe the mental side of the game. So I've got, if I look at the books I've got, it's all on mindset. So one of them's called Who Says You Can't You Do? And I love those books because it, it changes your thinking in day-to-day -day life as well. Um, yeah, so he gave me different techniques. And for me, um, a battle mentally was when I had trials, I really got nervous. And obviously I wanted to do really well, but he really gave me different techniques to try and manage that. And ultimately, I, I literally say this to him, if you didn't give me those techniques, maybe I wouldn't have, the, would have never done so well in that Crystal Palace trial. Mm. Um, and it, it must say it's really helped me. And now whenever I speak to younger girls or boys, I really push on that mental side of the game because at the end of the day, I always think that the mental side is more important than the physical side on a match day. Um, yeah. yeah. That's really, really good. It's good that you, you did that. That sounds like, you know, it's, it's super important. The mental side is, is a huge, huge part. Um, how, how do you see that then um, going forward for you? What, what, what do you hope for? What are your intentions with your game and your future? Yeah, I think I've got a, a few different things that I, I want to get lined up. But obviously, for me, the first one is kind of breaking into the, the first team at Crystal Palace and starting my journey to get as a professional footballer, because that's always been my my goal. 
um, in life is to be a professional footballer at the highest level. So mm -hmm. that is my number one goal in terms of the future. But also I've just started my um, coaching um, pathway um, and I just want to give back to the grassroots game. So I really can't wait to, to get my, just to be a coach and get in front of a group of girls and just share my passion and desire because um, I think it's so important and I love to do media stuff as well um, to really raise the visibility and exposure. Um, so I've got a few things lined up, but the, the professional footballer is always my, my biggest goal and um, all my energy and focus is always on, on that and hopefully having breaking into the, the first team in the coming years is always a, a big goal of mine for the upcoming future. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure that's going to happen, Leo. I don't really have any doubt about it, and uh, yeah, I think you'll. I think you'll make it happen. So, what, what, what do you like to do outside of football? Who are you outside of football? Because this is a big thing that I do in the work that I do. That you know, when you, when you, it doesn't matter if it's sport. It could be, you know, it could be a big celebrity or a big actor, and everyone knows you for that one thing. And clearly, your one thing is is football. But, you know, we are multifaceted as human beings. You know, there is many things that make us who we are. So who are you aside from this, this obviously budding professional footballer? <laughs> it's difficult because I've, I've got this asked this question once before and it really makes you think because mm -hmm. I think there's a big thing in terms of identity. Because if I look at my whole life, it is really a revolved around football. And yeah. if, I, if I have to take that kind of thing away from me I always know that I'm extremely family orientated I'm always I just love sport in general um love music um and I'm quite an outgoing person and that's kind of me away from from the pitch but I also love like kind of my independent time and my alone time so it could be on the walks just listening to music just having a good time <laughs> um that that's me off the pitch um but it's a really good question because I do think a lot of people struggle with the identity um, side of things. And throughout this kind of second period of lockdown, because I've been going through an injury, I've started to think about who am I off the pitch? Yeah. And I've started to think about different different sort of things. But I think that's me off it. Um, yeah, but it is a, a, it's a really difficult question because my life literally revolves around football. Yeah. It, it is, and it, you know, I've had many conversations with people about it um, and who we are outside of the main thing that drives us. You know, my business is my main driver, but there are many other elements of my life that, uh, that I need to keep an eye on. And, you know, mm -hmm. you need to keep your, have relationships with your family and your friends and do other things that you enjoy as well. So and those are sort of some of the areas that generally I work in is making sure that you don't forget those things as well, because sport, mm -hmm. you know, is part of life it's it's not your life because yes it's a huge part of your life but it's not everything and sometimes people mm -hmm. can get lost in that you know elite athletes can get lost in that and there are times sure when you literally have to focus on nothing else if you're training for an olympics there are going to be times when that is just all consuming i'm sorry but there is but equally you have to be you have to keep all of the other tanks as i call them of life topped up you know you an intimate relationship you know your family your friends other interests as well so they are super important to keep your eye on going forward which I know you're, you're a smart smart cookie um you, you obviously clearly understand all of that which is amazing um I'm conscious of, of time um a couple of couple of quick questions I guess what what's the one question um I haven't asked you that you wish I had oh um <laughs> that's a really good question <laughs> that's a good one that isn't um it? god I'd probably say maybe to do with um, the growth of the women's game in terms of not just me as a footballer, but how we could really develop the women's game and really make it take off, which it is doing, mm -hmm. um, would probably be a question, but... Um, well, let, let's dig into it. I all, I, <laughs> yeah, sometimes I do, uh, and I like to ask that one, especially when when I'm trying to keep the interview shorter, um, which I struggle <laughs> to do, because I could talk all day about sport, quite frankly. So, okay, answer your own question then. 
Yeah, I think because I could go on this topic for a few yeah. hours myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think the biggest thing for me is um, to really make sure everyone needs to get behind it um, because it's absolutely incredible and it's the same thing. Football is for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, no matter what your gender is, that shouldn't be a reason why you watch the game or you don't watch the game. Um, and I think for me, I'd like to stop the comparison between men's football and women's football. I think you don't really get that comparison in other sports. I think it's really a big comparison in, in women's football. Mm -hmm. And I honestly think that we're on our own pathway and we're, we're, we're doing our own thing. And we're going to be able to stand on our two feet. We don't always have to rely on men's clubs to support us. I think we could achieve that. Um, and if you look at the viewing numbers of the World Cup, I think it was 1.1 billion people tuned in to watch that final. Yeah. I think for me, um, as a young player and for someone who's trying to inspire that next generation, I'm so happy where the women's game is because like on a Zoom call, I was asking them, who's your role model and who's your favourite player to look up to? If you asked me that question maybe three or four years ago, I'd probably say a male footballer, but all of these girls were saying, oh, Steph Horton, Lucy Bronze. And and I just loved that. And one of them said, Rio, I, you're my inspiration. And for me, that's the biggest thing that it just means the world, right? Um, and I think the women's game isn't going anywhere and I just can't wait. Um, for the Euros and the World Cup coming up, I think it's a really exciting time um, to be a footballer at the moment. Yeah, it is. And let's hope we can, you know, grow the game and grow visibility of women's sport in general. But yeah, football, I'm a massive football fan. And um, I guess off the back of you, you saying that, then who is your idol? Who was your idol growing up? Has it changed? I have a few, like whenever I get asked this question, I say a different name because I, had, I have a lot. Um, I think my biggest one is probably my mum because she's done absolutely everything for me and yeah, she's the right. person that sees me on the off days um, and picks me up when, for example, this injury, mm. she's the one saying, Rio, you're going to get through this kind of thing and it means a lot. And if I look at it from maybe a sport aspect, I think... Um, the ones I really looked up to when I was younger was um, Annie Aluko, uh, Katie Chapman, um, Jill Scott, um, Kirsty Peeling, who was my coach, just so many. Um, yeah. And then the men's game, Ronaldo, Wayne Rooney, Rio Ferdinand. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Rio Ferdinand, so that was, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was, that was um, a big moment for me. But um, yeah, I've, I've got a, a lot of role models, but I'm really glad that I have these role models because without them, I wouldn't really necessarily think that I'm on a, a career pathway. So yeah. I'm really, I'm grateful that I've got all these role models in my life. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And we need to get, you know, some of these, you know, big name women, sports women and footballers sort of more in mainstream media so that, you know, it's great that the girls all came along to your session and were able to name Steph Houghton and, you know, Lucy Bronze and all of that, but they're into the sport. And we also want the other, everyone else who's not necessarily in the sport to see that as well. And that it's okay to play, play sport and you can still be girly and feminine, but at yeah. the same time you can be strong and physical to go with it. So we need, we need to, to, you know, get, get that more visibility around that in a wider world. And um, you're going to be in great esteemed company on this podcast because Katie Chapman is coming on. Um, so when it gets released, she'll be on and uh, Dame Kelly Holmes will be on. So you're going to be an esteemed company and uh, <laughs> when, when it all comes out. Um, so I look forward to releasing that. OK, last couple of quick, quick fire questions. I always do a couple oh, of fine, okay. <laughs> OK, four favourite foods. Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I love the Chinese. So chicken chow mein. Um, okay, nice. Uh, chocolate cake if we're going for dessert <laughs> <laughs> um, chicken just chicken in general I love protein um, and a good like cheeseburger I just noticed that these foods were really unhealthy <laughs> do you know <laughs> what they're my favorite <laughs> it's fine you know I've, I've had a few international athletes on here and most of them say a burger most of them yeah say that's, a, that's a good one in. Um, so yeah, um, they, you know we all love our food, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. I love Four favorite films. Oh, um, James Bond. 
um as in i think i would literally name them so spectre i love that one um <laughs> skyfall uh two other oh, no, let me not go all james bond um, yeah come on pick some other <laughs> um, mission impossible um yeah, and also what's that film called Oh, actually, let me go with a classic, Mamma Mia. I've probably watched that about 20 times. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. It's an easy to watch film, isn't it? It's a dead Yeah, literally film. one of those. That's amazing. You like your action films, clearly. Yeah, I do like my action films. <laughs> Final question then. Four words that describe Rio. <laughs> um, passionate, driven and hardworking. If that goes into yeah. hard work, we need no, only one more. Oh, one more. Um, loyal. Brilliant. Rio, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for being on. I wish you luck with your career. I can't wait to see you get your professional contract. I'm going to be whooping in the background. I know <laughs> it's come in. And hopefully I can come to your first game as well when you play professionally. And like I say, I do know it's coming you're an amazing young woman just keep doing what you're doing uh, and it's a pleasure to know you oh thank you so much and thank you for having me on and um i've, I've stolen your slogan i'm i'm using it in my day-to-day -day life now it starts with you so yeah, loving, loving what you're doing so thank you so much for having me on and you're putting the spotlight on incredible people um just in life not just within the sports industry so thanks for having me no worries rio thank you